vulnerable megacities. How the study of past civilizations can help the cities of the future. Roland Fletcher, University of Sydney. On November the 9th, 1989, I was in Sydney, Australia, and vividly remember the people celebrating and pulling apart the huge concrete slabs. It's a great honour to be here. Uh, just before I commence, I would like to acknowledge the project of which I'm part and the director. It's a very large international team working with my honoured French colleagues and with the Cambodian authorities and researchers who manage the huge site of Angkor. My purpose today is to talk about breaking down the wall between past social time, deep social time, and the present, raising the possibility that the proposition here is, can the past tell us whether there are walls that we do not know about? It's ironic that this image was shown at the beginning of the day, uh, to talk about the spaces where the energy is coming from. Uh, what I'm, of course, interested in is that this is the marker of where humankind is located in cities. As with a number of other comments in the talks today, what is important to note is that 50% of humankind now lives in cities. This is an unprecedented development. It has occurred within a space of a century. We have no prior experience for this condition. We have generally been a marginal urban inhabitant. Two places illustrate the pattern of development of our cities. One is the East Coast megalopolis in the United States, identified in the 1960s by Gene Gottman, the classic example of the great sprawling, spread out, interconnected urban world that we are now living in. At the other end of the world, in China, is the giant Shanghai greater urban complex, stretching out far to the west and consuming great old Chinese cities like Suchow, with more than 60 to 80 million people residing in this location. But these are great, sprawling, low-density places with vast amounts of open land in them, they are not the model of the old European or Chinese compact dense city. If you look at the statistics of what has happened to urban density since 1800, what you can see is that the general trend is to drop towards lower and lower density. Not only is 50% of humankind living in cities, 50% of humankind is living in cities which are moving towards low density, and all the very big ones are extremely low density. Now, there's been a great debate about this phenomenon, and it has tended to be assumed that low-density urbanism is a consequence of industrialization, a consequence of the internal combustion engine, of the real estate market, and the bourgeoisie. Uh, this, regrettably, is not the case. Low-density settlement patterns have actually been a characteristic of humankind for many millennia. There are hunter-gatherer communities that live in vast, low-density spreads out in the Australian desert. There are agriculturalists who live in such places, and there are very famous urban communities which use this pattern. Curiously, in the 60s, the first of them identified in archaeology was the great complexes of the Maya in the forests of Central America. This is the classic of Tikal in the forests of Guatemala. Those of you who are addicts of Star Wars will recognize this as the rebel base in the first of the Star Wars movies. Underneath that forest is an enormous landscape of residences, small shrines, water tanks, and roadways. This is just a tiny portion of the absolute center of that urban landscape. It covers about 200 square kilometers, and the bulk of it looks like that patchy scatter of residents which you can see. 
We now know from the work of Robin Conningham from the University of Durham that the same kind of pattern exists in the great old Buddhist cities of northern Sri Lanka, famously represented by Anuradhapura. This is one of its great shrines. We can now see that Anuradhapura, from the surveys of his team and his Sri Lankan colleagues, is a scattered landscape covering somewhere on the order of 500 square kilometers of shrines, monasteries, and small scatters of housing. We then come to the monster, the great giant of these pre-industrial low-density cities is the place which the French researchers of the EFVO have been working on for a century and which my team from Australia came into working in the late 90s. The great city of Angkor, the capital of the Khmer Empire between the 9th and the 14th century, is located on the north side of a great lake, the Tomplesap, and that lake is the source of its power. The lake expands and contracts every year, delivers 7,000 square kilometers of annually flooded rice land. This is a bit like living in agricultural Fort Knox. The work of Christophe Potier, working on the ground with a motorbike and old aerial photographs, began the process of understanding the vast extent of the landscape of Angkor. Everybody's familiar with that stuff in the middle, the famous enclosure of Angkor Thom, the great temple of Angkor Wat. But what Christoph began to show was that the whole landscape was covered with housing and shrines. There were 600 shrines in the landscape of Angkor. Great roadways and canals spread across the landscape. The work that we have been doing in collaboration with Christoph has derived from his generosity and his goodwill, and I'm deeply grateful to him. He worked very closely with a graduate student of mine, Damon Evans, who's now a senior researcher, and between them they produced this map of the entire catchment area of Angkor, of about 3,000 square kilometers, with the urban area of Angkor covering about 1,000 square kilometers in the middle. This is not a compact city like Rome. This is more like Los Angeles in the 1950s. Indeed, if you could have flown over it in the 12th century AD, you would have seen something very like Los Angeles. Long roadways like freeways, thousands and thousands of water tanks like the swimming pools of Los Angeles spread across the landscape. It was an astonishingly beautiful place. This is a visualization by one of my colleagues from Monash, part of a series of movie images using games technology with great temples and thousands of people. The population of Angkor was probably about three quarters of a million, which you can calculate very reliably from the rice supply of the area. Just to give you some idea of the magnitude of this place, that is Greater Angkor on the same scale as Berlin. This is Angkor Wat, the great iconic World Heritage location. The importance of this image is a gestalt shift. Look at the hills in the distance. That is one quarter of the urban landscape of Angkor, from where you are located out to the edge of those hills. And that is the size of Angkor Wat. Angkor Wat, from one end to the other, is the length of the Unter den Linden. This is a gigantic creation. Between the 12th and the 13th century, when it reached its maximum size, it has somewhere on the order of three quarters of a million people in it. This is an image done courtesy of National Geographic. We have done a sleight of hand. Had you actually seen it from the air in that period, all you would have seen was the economic trees around the houses. We've taken the trees off so you can actually see the residential landscape. It's a place of huge complexity. It has great roadways, causeways, reservoirs, thousands of water tanks. These are the local catchments of each of those water tanks. From our recent work, 
a LIDAR survey in 2012 looking at the area hidden under the forest in the center of Angkor, we've been able to identify this immensely elaborate grid pattern. Most of this dates to the 12th century. It has its initial ancestry in Angkor Wat. It spreads all over that central area, including within that very late enclosure of Angkor Thom. The accuracy of LIDAR is down to 12 centimeters. That is an image taken through triple canopy forest. If any of you want to know what is going on under forests, spend $1,000 per square kilometer and use LIDAR. It's a remarkable technology. Most of the people in Angkor, however, were not living in that middle area. There were maybe 40,000 people in the enclosure, a quarter of a million in the whole central area. The rest of the population is living in these patchwork residences around water tanks with their rice fields around them and living along the Great Canals. This is a modern illustration. This is the modern river of Siem Reap. This image no longer exists. But when you're thinking of Angkor now, don't think of great temples. Think of thousands and thousands of people living in conditions like this. They are dependent, which is very significant to this story, on a massive, massive water system with great intake canals in the north. The north-south one is 25 kilometers long, for example. The great holding tanks in the middle, which are switching systems, and the great distributor canals out to the south. To give you some idea of the scale of this infrastructure, this is massive industrial scale construction. This is a view over the West Barai, courtesy of National Geographic. That shrine is four kilometers away from the western end of the West Barai. There is 50 million cubic meters of water in that reservoir. It's five meters deep at its deepest. Its banks all around contain 20 million cubic meters of dirt. This is not a hole in the ground. This is a reservoir built on the former ground surface in order to gain the advantage of a raised level of water using no machinery. This is remarkable technology. In addition, they cleared the entire landscape. None of the natural forest existed in the period of Angkor. It was all converted into rice fields, and you can see the grid of the Angkorian rice fields in that pattern up to the left of Angkor Wat. You can't see those on the ground. They're only visible to radar. Thousands of square kilometers of landscape had the natural forest completely removed to be replaced by engineered agriculture and an artificial system of agricultural forestry. This is happening again. These are the hills immediately to the north of Angkor. The whole landscape is being cleared of forest for agriculture. Why is this serious? We now know that the demise of Angkor coincides with a crisis period in climate change from the medieval warm phase to the Little Ice Age. For a period of somewhere on the order of 150 years, the climate in Southeast Asia oscillated between mega monsoons and mega drought, that gray zone you can see. Angkor's record disappears in the 1320s when it reappears in the 16th century, only Angkor Wat and Angkor Thom are referred to. All the rest of that great landscape has disappeared. In the center of Angkor, right in the middle of its areas, we can see from the LIDAR the immense damage from water flow. You can see here how the water has simply gouged away <coughs> great portions of the landscape. And if you go down south, the canals are full of sand. The system collapsed. What happened was that the population of Angkor and the population of the heartland of this world moved outwards, away from the periphery, worryingly, Exactly the same occurred for the Maya in the 9th century, 
on a maize economy in Sri Lanka in the 12th century and in Cambodia in the 14th century. We are seeing the end of a world. The climate system, extreme instability, takes apart low-density urbanism. The great issue for us is, should we be concerned for the similarity to our world? Thank you. Thank you.